Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video series where we talk about general vector spaces and things we can do in them. And indeed, in today's part 22, we will talk about the general concept of a linear map. And there you should know, this is like in the original linear algebra course, a linear map is a map that conserves our linear structure of the vector space. However, as always, before we go into the details, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And moreover, as a thank you, you can find additional material for all the videos with the link in the description. In particular, there you find my whole book about linear algebra, which should help you to learn the concepts. Okay, now without further ado, let's immediately start with the concept of a linear map. The picture is always the same. Let's imagine we have a vector space V here and then we can visualize vectors with arrows. So maybe let's say we have a vector U here and a vector V. And now we just consider a map F that maps the vector space V to another vector space W. This means now the images of the vectors U and V could lie anywhere in our vector space W here. For example, the result could look like this. However, in the case of a linear map, everything inside this parallelogram here is also already fixed. In particular, this means the image of the vector addition u plus v is also already fixed. So the image of this new vector here has to be this one on the right. So this picture is already important to remember. A linear map cannot do much. Indeed, it sends a line from the left hand side to a line to the right hand side or it collapses it to the origin. So you can remember that lines stay lines or they collapse. In fact, with a linear map, you will not introduce any curves on the right hand side. This is the result of conserving the linear structure and the linear structure just consists of the vector addition and the scalar multiplication. This is something we have already discussed in Rn, but it also holds in this general context. But maybe before we go into the abstract concept, first recall what we know in Rn. So we could have a linear map that maps Rn into Rm. And then it was possible to construct a matrix that represents this linear map. And then this matrix A has exactly n columns and m rows. So usually we write, it's an element of r to the power m times n. Moreover, in the linear algebra course, we also show that we have the opposite direction here. So each matrix induces a linear map. Indeed, this is something we always used. We can go from the abstract concept of a linear map to the concrete one of a matrix and the other way around. And now it will turn out that in some sense, this will also hold in the general context of general vector spaces. However, first we should write down the explicit definition of a linear map. Now the first thing we need are two general vector spaces V and W. So we just write that these are our two F vector spaces. And you already know, usually our field F here is given by the real numbers or by the complex numbers. In fact, the important thing here is that we chose the same F for both vector spaces. So we don't mix different fields in the definition. We have the same on the left as on the right. And then the concept of a linear map makes sense. So we write that we have a map F from V to W. More precisely, any map here is called linear if it fulfills two properties. And now you already know, these two properties just mean that we conserve our linear structure. Hence, we can distinguish addition and scaling. So let's start with the vector addition and as in the picture above, we consider u plus v. So in the picture, we find this vector here on the left and now we already know on the right hand side, this should also be a vector addition. In fact, this should be f of u plus f of v. And now please note that we have different plus signs here in the equation. So the plus sign on the left hand side denotes the vector addition in V and the one on the right hand side denotes the vector addition in W. So the vector spaces could be completely different 
and therefore also the vector addition is a different operation. However, a linear map still tells us that it translates the one vector addition into the other. This is what we mean by conserving the linear structure. It's a translation from the one linear structure to the other one. Therefore, we get the same thing now for the scalar multiplication. There, the picture is much simpler because we only need one vector u. And now this one might have the image here in w. And then the scalar multiplication means that we can stretch this vector as much as we want. Hence, the image of lambda times u here we find in the same direction here in w. So usually people say we can pull the scalar out of the linear map. So we have f of lambda times u and this is the same as lambda times f of u. So also here we have a natural property for a linear map. But please don't forget, as before, the operation, the scalar multiplication is different on both sides again. So now you can remember, for a linear map, you can exchange the order of the operations. So for example, you can either first apply the vector addition here and then the linear map, or you first apply the linear map to the vectors and then the vector addition. And the same we have for the scalar multiplication, either first scaling the vector and then applying the map, or first applying the map and then scaling the result. So this is something we have in general, a linear map always makes sense for vector spaces. We just need to satisfy these two properties and of course for every vector u and v and every scalar lambda. And then you see why it's important that we consider the same field on both sides. Simply because otherwise pulling out the scalar would make problems either on the left hand side or the right hand side. Okay, so this is the general definition which is important to remember, but now before we look at some examples, I would say let's prove a general fact for a linear map. In fact, this is something we already know for the special linear maps in Rn, but we can prove it in general now. So we want to answer the question, how does a linear map act on the zero vector? Hence, what we have to put in now is the zero vector of the vector space V. Therefore, let's call it zero with index V. And now the first step here is that we use the fact that we can scale any vector to the zero vector. So we just have to use the zero in the field of the scalars. And then it does not matter, we can take any vector u and scale it with zero. And now you see in the case that we have a linear map f, we can use this second property there which simply means we can pull out the scalar which is given by zero. And then we are in the vector space w, but we have the same reasoning, which means we can scale any vector with zero. And the result will be the zero vector in w. Hence, we can remember a linear map f always sends the zero vector to the zero vector. So this is an important general result for linear maps and it means you can always check for linearity by simply checking out the zero vector first. If the map does not send zero to zero, it's not a linear map. So with that in mind, let's look at some nice examples here. And since we talked a lot about inner products in the last video, I would say let's start with the one here as well. So maybe V should be given as F3 and W simply as F. So you know, we either have two real vector spaces here or two complex ones. And now in addition, let's fix a vector a from v. So it simply means a has three components here. And of course, we also know the inner product in f3, namely the standard inner product. And now by considering that, we can define a linear map. Namely, let's say f of u is defined by the standard inner product A with U. Now clearly this satisfies the two properties because we already know the properties of an inner product. In fact, we have already stated that an inner product has to be linear in the second argument. Hence, any inner product already gives us examples for linear maps. 
But please don't forget, this one now is a linear map from a three-dimensional vector space into a one-dimensional one. This means if we want to have an example where the vector space on the right hand side is not one-dimensional, we have to do something else. Okay, but now since this is the standard inner product in F3, we can also write it as a matrix multiplication. In particular, we can say we have a star as a row vector multiplied by using the matrix multiplication with a column vector u. Now in the case that you don't remember this adjoint operation with the star, let me refresh your memory. Indeed, for real vector spaces, the star just denotes the transpose operation. However, in complex vector spaces, we also have a complex conjugation in addition. This means every entry here in the row vector also gets a complex conjugation. And then we see the standard inner product has a short notation by using the matrix multiplication. However, it also tells us that the linear map F is completely determined by this matrix here. So we immediately see the result I mentioned before, linear maps and matrices are related. But now the natural question is, does this fact also hold in more abstract examples? So you could ask, what about function spaces? For example, the polynomial spaces. Hence here V is the vector space of the polynomial functions where the degree is less or equal than 3. And on the other hand, our W should consist of the polynomials where the degree is less or equal than 2. Okay, and there we can define a nice linear map, which I want to denote by lowercase l. And indeed, it should just take a polynomial function P and send it to the derivative of P. So we could write, we send P to P prime. So for example, if we take the polynomial function that sends x to x squared and put it into our map L, then the result is a polynomial function again, but now in W. Indeed, in this case, we have x is sent to 2x. So not so surprising, and you see, you just need to know the derivatives of polynomials. And then the result is, as you can show, that this map L is a linear map. In fact, this follows immediately by the properties of the differentiation. So for example, we could just check what happens if we put P and Q into the map L. And we combine them with the vector addition in our vector space, which means we just add functions. And now we just need to know what is the derivative of the addition of two functions. And then, as you should know from analysis, we can pull in this prime. So we simply have p prime plus q prime, which is of course l of p plus l of q. Hence, with that line, the first property for a linear map is proven. And now you know we can do the same thing with the second property. There you just need to know how to deal with derivatives if a scalar is involved. And also there we know from analysis that we can pull out scalars. Indeed, we already knew that the whole differentiation process is a linear map. But here you see, it's no problem at all to write this down again. So there we have it. This is our first abstract example of a linear map. But you can see, it still acts between finite dimensional vector spaces. Therefore, you might expect that we can also describe this linear map with a matrix. And indeed, we can do that we can still describe linear maps by using matrices. But I would say, let's discuss this in the next video. So I really hope we meet again and have a nice day. Bye bye.